Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, my guest is Cliff Droke from the Cabot Wealth Network. Interesting distribution day. We've called different, uh, you know, we've called uh, accumulation days. We've called digestion days, which is how I would characterize a lot of recent days that we've had. Not necessarily directional, but more just digesting recent gains. This, I am fairly confident in declaring it more of a distribution day. This is where we're starting to see some downside follow through on groups like semiconductors and others that have been in pretty good uptrends up until now. What does this mean for the big picture? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets together, focusing on the message of the markets themselves. I've uh, told many people when they talk about uh, market expectations, how to, how to you know, absorb everything that's going on and try to make sense of them. I would, I would, I would argue the chart is the best tool you have in your arsenal to try to make sense of things. If you know nothing else about a ticker, a stock, a company, an asset class, look at the chart, look at the trends and how they've evolved. That will give you a window into the fundamental uh, stories, into the economic conditions, into the geopolitical conditions, because price arguably reflects all of those, uh, all that known information through the lens of investor psychology. Now this, as we mentioned in, in the introduction, quite a distribution day with the NASDAQ down uh, three and a half percent. The S and P closing down almost two and a half percent, accelerating there, uh, really into the into the close. So a lot of charts to review, lines in the sand to pay attention to. We'll get to it as soon as we can. We have some fantastic guests coming up on this show. I'm excited to talk to Cliff Droke uh, a little later next week. A couple things to highlight for you on Monday. I'll be going on Erin uh, Swenland's Decision Point Trading Room. She does a live trading room every Monday at noon Eastern. I hope you can join us there. Go to decisionpoint.com to register for that. On Tuesday, Jonathan Krinsky from Baycrest Partners. On Wednesday, Jeff Huge from JWH Investments in Minneapolis. And then on Thursday, Ari Wald, the technical analyst at Oppenheimer. So it's quite an institutional representation. These are some of the uh, analysts that uh, that uh, top investment houses tend to follow. So it'll be fantastic to hear how they're digesting this uh, current market environment. As we get to our market recap, you know, I tweeted earlier just about the S&P 500 and, and uh, this was, you know, after yesterday's bounce, it was like, all right, the bear market checklist is number one, you have to break the first trend line, which was the pink trend line in the illustration. That's done. We did that actually back here in late January, mid-January, and then retested it and now rolled over again. Step two, you break the 50 day and you break this uh, trend line support as well. Step three, you break 3,700. You break uh, the the uh, the support, uh, the previous swing low, basically from January. A lot of stocks have a very similar set of lines that you could or, or or steps that you could list out in terms of the bear market checklist. This is what tells me that the uptrend is over and that the, the bear a bearish trend is starting to evolve. And if you look, we clo we're closing right around that. Uh, that's you know that trend line it looks like we're just going to close below the trend line in the way that I've uh, I've drawn up right about there and just above the 50-day moving average. So I think the remainder of this week that will be the the real test. Are we holding that sort of support like we did back here in late January, or do we break that? If so, 3,700. That's the next uh, that's the next level. But my bull market checklist <laughs> just below that was keep going up, keep making higher highs and higher lows. And even though this has been disruptive. I would, I would, you know, certainly am expecting more downside than we've seen so far. I think this is the beginning of something more in terms of price and time, but that remains to be seen in terms of the chart itself. If we would bottom here, it's a just continued uptrend, higher highs, higher lows, and and a lot of charts can very quickly look very good uh, as long as you hold support. So I, I think it would be important if I if I were you looking at your portfolio, reflect on some of those lines in the sand for any of your holdings. Think about at what point you need to start thinking about higher probability for further downside risk. And as we talked about on the show, I think there's a, there's a non-zero probability. There's a non-zero risk, uh, meaning there is some, some uh, potential for the market to go meaningfully lower from here. And for me, meaningfully lower, lower would be down in the 3,200 range. 
which would take us back down to the September and October lows. There's a non-zero you know, probability that we go down to 2,200 again, although I think that's very, very low. The fact that we would retrace back down to something like 3,200, I don't think is that unreasonable. It's not that crazy of a pullback, even within the context of a long-term uptrend. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're between now and there, you know, I've always, it's been said, all large losses begin as small losses. If you can manage your risk and now focus on some of these levels that if we break this line, if we break this level, if we break down through this point, if we get this sort of signal, then I'm out of this stock of this chart, no matter what. Those are the types of things I would lay out now before those lines are triggered and make sure that you have a good game plan. Then you don't have to worry so much about what happens day to day, how many more of these sort of distribution days we have. There's a lot of carnage by a lot of different measures. We're going to do a, a segment a little later called Banking on Breath, where we're focused in particular on some of the breath conditions, how they're updating uh, this week, how they've been rolling over up until this uh, up until today, but how what today's move might uh, mean relative to uh, to others. Uh, one thing I just wanted to hit on that, we'll get to that later in the breath segment. Let's look at some of the other asset classes and other uh, indexes. So as I mentioned, the S&P down about two and a half percent. The NASDAQ really led the way lower. And this has been tech and consumer, really that unwinding of that large cap growth trade that's continued uh, with a fury today. The VIX back up uh, around 28.50 today with a pretty, pretty good up move uh, in, in volatility coming off a low around 20. Uh, Ten-year yields increasing and going above the one and a half percent mark for the first time in uh, in quite a long while. The TLT down another one point six percent today. So you know I mentioned with uh, like with the chart of Domino's Pizza DPZ, the fact that it went down so much today certainly could be a bit of a surprise, right? That's a more aggressive move than you might have expected given the normal volatility. But the fact that it's in a downtrend should not be a surprise, right? The bond markets have been in a downtrend. The TLT has been in an established downtrend for quite a while. So while this one day move certainly seems extreme and the last week certainly seems like it's accelerating, this downtrend has been in place for months, right? Six months ago, we saw this pattern of lower highs and lower lows. We've drawn this trend line that it has not been able to overcome. That's been going on for a while. So while the movement of one day can feel extreme, can feel unusual, remember that overall, the goal, I, I would argue, of a technical analyst is to focus on trend and identify where those trends are and follow those trends. The trend in the TLT has been down. The trend in most, most bond price measures, bond indexes, have been lower. So I think today's move, this week's move, while uh, you know certainly accelerating, while certainly uh, confirming strength, uh, it should not be a surprise. I think the direction of it, it has not been uh, in question for quite a while. Uh, continuing on, the dollar up about a third of a percent. That's one of the few things in the green besides interest rates and the VIX today. Commodity markets, the DBC down 0.8%, gold down almost 2%, silver down 2%. Uh, and, you know, we've talked about this sort of reflation trade, the, uh, you know, improvement in commodities overall, a bit of a hit today. And the question is overall, what is the long-term trend? I know we'll uh, talk with Cliff Droken a little bit about his take on commodities in the material sector. So we'll save the rest for that. Cryptocurrency is down as well. And I think this is a really interesting one to talk about for a moment, only because, you know, when as cryptocurrencies are becoming more and more uh, mainstream in terms of how we talk about them, in terms of how we think about them, you know, it's worth noting I, I, at times I've heard people claim or suggest or, uh, you know, speculate that something like Bitcoin could be a safe haven, right? If stocks are struggling, if stocks really start to rupture, we have a new bear market, would people flee to? something like Bitcoin, I think what we're seeing on days like the, today and what we've seen in recent weeks is that, you know, and, and this is not a surprise to me, Bitcoin is really a petri dish on uh, behavioral psychology manifesting itself in an asset price. Um, there's very little fundamental data to go on. Supply and demand, you could argue supply certainly uh, is something you can think about mining and all of that. But overall, I think it is just a clear representation of speculation. People are not, you know, people are speculating heavily on, on something like uh, Bitcoin and other cryptos. And so I think what you're seeing on days like this is that there's distribution when there's distribution in stocks that, you know, Bitcoin will come off as a risk off trade. It's not, you know, people, uh, you know, treating it as a, as a safety trade. Now I could be proven wrong if obviously cryptocurrencies continue to appreciate in a, in a down tape for stocks, but days like this sort of confirmed to me that it is not necessarily playing out like a safe haven. Arguably gold really isn't either. Very few things are today. Uh, but it's worth noting that relationship between stocks and cryptos because we still don't really have, don't have a lot of observations on that. In terms of sectors, I mentioned the weakness in consumer discretionary and technology. That's certainly the the uh, leading the way lower. What actually 
uh, went down the least. Everything was down today in terms of the 11 sectors, utilities, healthcare, staples, one, two, three, all down around 1% today. So th that's where the relative strength is really flowing. Utilities have been one place we haven't talked about a ton, only because the price chart isn't great. And if you look, the chart of utilities doesn't make me feel super good about it. And that, you know, it being up today is just this little blip within the context of a downtrend. So, you know, I'm seeing the XOU fail at support. I'm seeing it back below its 200 day moving average for the first time since, you know, last September. So I'm not seeing a lot on the price chart that gets me excited. Also, the relative strength is not uh, is not very impressive as well. So I'd be looking less at something like that, which is struggling on a price basis and struggling on a relative basis. I would be looking at things that are able to hold up uh, on a relative basis. Look for things where the relative strength is continuing to improve. Uh, industrials might be one that comes to mind. You know, obviously things like um, you know financials and others would be would be interesting to pay attention to. Financials at the XLF, and you can see the the price and the relative going up. What's interesting on the XLF, and I'm sorry we're jumping around a, a ton here, but you know, the XLF worth noting a bearish uh, engulfing pattern, uh, you know, and again, that's a short term pattern. That's not telling you necessarily we're at a, you know, the top. It is suggesting a top. It's suggesting short term distribution, a big up move day one, a big down move day two. It's an outside day, meaning the range of day two exceeds the range of the first day. Overall, that tends to be a little more negative for the next uh, couple price bars. So even on sectors that are performing well on a relative basis, we're seeing some signs of, of, of short term weakness as well, which doesn't make me feel super optimistic about the rest of this week going into uh, the weekend. That's all the time we have for our, for our market recap. I'd encourage you again, if you're looking for opportunities and looking where to park in, in an environment, if you expect for the downside, look on a day like today on what stocks actually appreciated. CME, I want to say, yeah, is one that did so. Focus on those types of names overall. You should be able to weather things a little better. Let's take a quick break back with my guest, Cliff Droke. We'll see you in a minute. everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's so good to have you join us every weekday after the close for our show. As a reminder, we'll do another mailbag segment on Friday's show tomorrow. We'd love to answer one of your questions on the air. No question is out of bounds. Ask us about the markets, about particular tickers, ratios, breadth, sentiment, psychology, technical indicators, whatever it is, we'll do our best to point you in the right direction. You can email us questions at thefinalbar at stockcharts.com, on Twitter at finalbarsctv, or on our YouTube channel. Just put a comment right below the video that you're watching. We hope to answer one of your questions on the air. Also, one final reminder before we get to our guests, we have just this week released the new Stock Charts TV on demand. This show is appearing on there uh, along with all the others on the Stock Charts TV lineup. Go to stockchartstv.com to set up a free account and access all of our videos, or it's on all the app stores, Apple, Roku, Android, et cetera, et cetera. I want to welcome on my guest, Cliff Droke. Cliff's an analyst with Cabot Wealth Network coming to us from North Carolina. Cliff, welcome back to the show. Thanks, David. Good to be here as always. So we were talking before we, we, we started the show. Uh, the last time you were on was in March of 2020, and it was one of the most beautifully timed interviews. I, I, I have to tell you, it was well done because within a week of the low, I had you on and you said, the panic low is very, very soon. <laughs> so well done there. I, you, you deserve a victory lap for that one. I'm Thank very you. interested now that the markets have rotated, obviously, from a, a period of weakness when we last spoke to now a period of severe strength. Talk us through what you're seeing. Well, this was, this was an interesting day to uh, come on the final bar. As you mentioned in the introductory comments, you know, everything is, seems to be down categorically. Uh, and, and really the key, as you mentioned, or, or I should say, you did say bond prices are in a downward trend. And I think that's the key to interpreting this market right now. Uh, bond prices are down, which means bond interest rates are up. And because treasury yields are rising, that to me is indicative of rising inflation. And I, from my perspective, that's going to be the investment theme of 2021, rising inflation and how can an investor benefit from it? So the first chart is looking at the commodity index. Now, you know, talk about bonds being in a pretty consistent downtrend. When you look at the DVC, it's the opposite, right? It's this thing that's 
you know, really emerge and continue to go up. What do you see with commodities going forward then in this environment? Well, as the chart shows, the relative strength is clearly point, uh, tilted in favor of commodities over equities. It has been since November. And I expect that trend to continue because the, the dollar index is weakening and with uh, you know, further stimulus on the table and uh, productivity is going to be somewhat subdued this year. It, so, uh, and the other thing is we're looking at a, a number of inflation measures, uh, inflation expectation measures like the five-year break-even inflation rate, which is right now at a 10-year high. All of these things point to a continuation of the inflationary trend. So in my opinion, investors should be looking at stocks and ETFs, which are a direct play, particularly on things like metals and mining, oil and gas, and to some extent, agricultural commodities. Uh, and this Invesco Commodity Index Tracking Fund encompasses all of those things. Now, when we think of the 11 S&P sectors, right, and you think of an inflationary environment, as you mentioned, you think of gold, gold stocks, and the XLB has certainly been one of those interesting stories. A lot of people have focused on financials, breaking to new eyes, energy breaking out. But with industrials and the materials, they've actually had pretty pretty solid runs here and really starting to reemerge. Is this where you see uh, opportunity? Talk us through this. Absolutely. I, I see more opportunity in uh, base industrial metals than I do in precious metals in, in the short term. I think this could be a good year for gold and silver as we head further in. Uh, to the year, but what's keep constraining gold, in my opinion, are is rising treasury yields. Basically, mm. you know, the competition between bonds and gold. But industrial metals are on fire, and I and as China and Asia, the Asian economies continue to strengthen, and as the U.S. dollar continues to weaken, I don't see this trend reversing um, anytime soon. Certainly not in the intermediate term. So XLB, the material sector, should continue to outperform. You know, you mentioned uh, base metals, right? Copper has has been, you know, multi-year highs, a pretty pretty impressive run, and we've seen obviously the the move recently with uh, with China overall in a in a fairly decent uh, fairly decent uptrend. You know, when you're looking right now, what how what would you describe as the risk to this thesis? What would tell you maybe that this is not playing out as you expected? Is is it a uh, you know a lack of participation with something like materials? Is it commodities starting to weaken, or is it something with interest rates? What would be that one chart you would look at to sort of make sure that this thesis is playing out as expected for you? Well, I would keep a very close watch on the U.S. dollar index, and mm. if for some reason it began to shoot higher uh, unexpectedly, that would definitely put a dent uh, in the inflation thesis mm. uh, to to a lesser extent. A dramatic decline in, like for instance, ten-year Treasury yields, um, in conjunction with rising um, the rising dollar index, would put a big dent, at least intermediate term, in the uh, commodities reflation turnaround. It's a fascinating uh, look, and I love that description of the uh, of the inflation risk. It's it's again, it's something that I think a lot of people have not sort of had in their mental space for a little too long. So it could be a, a shock of sorts to the system as we deal with a rising rate uh, rising rate environment. Cliff Drop, this is so good to have you back on. Thanks so much for walking us through what you're thinking. I hope you and those around you stay safe. We'll talk Bye. to you again soon. Thank you, David. That's Cliff Drop. Cliff's an analyst with Cabot Wealth Network. Uh, based in North Carolina, I boy, I mean, talk about it. I love that that walk through that that thesis. If you think about it, you know, the first thing that Cliff started with was rising interest rates, and uh, you know, again, if I'm if I'm thinking of one chart, the, there are a couple that come to mind, right? The dollar chart obviously is an important one. Just a chart of the S and P, and just thinking about you know key lines in the sand and what you can do. But I tell you what, most things that are happening right now, in some way, you can tie it back to rising rates and what that's what that's doing. And I think to what what I just uh, sort of hinted at with Cliff at the end there, I, what concerns me is the fact that you have very few investors that have been actively investing in a rising rate environment, especially for any meaningful amount of time. You have to go back to you know before 1980 uh, to find people that have been investing during an extended period of rising rates. And if that's what we're looking at going forward, I'm going to be digging back in the playbook from uh, from those years to see how people dealt with it, because it's not something I've experienced uh, experienced over the long term uh, for sure uh, over uh, over my career. Great take there from uh, from Cliff Drug. We need to continue on. Our next segment is called Banking on Breadth. This is where we look at breadth conditions 
a lot of movement right now, obviously, in the markets and a lot of rotation today. Today was certainly a distribution day. You know, our breadth readings, as you probably know, some of them, they start updating at the close and then are processed over the next uh, hour or two as we digest all the closing data. So some of this might not be updated for today's close just yet. I'll make a point of, uh, of pointing that out if I can. You know, and I think it's, this is a perfect place to start. If you look at the cumulative advanced decline lines uh, well, for the, for the market, this is not updated for today's close just yet. These lines will most likely go down pretty significantly given the, the, the distribution that we saw today. And we'll get to that particular chart in a minute. But when I'm looking at this, you know, up until today, you're seeing higher highs in the S&P overall, right? This trend of higher highs and higher lows. You're seeing higher trends uh, or strong uptrends in the cumulative advanced decline lines, right? So if you look at the NYSE, large caps, mid caps, small caps, all of these are continuing to slope, uh, continuing to slope upwards. What I would be looking for, so one of my traditional bull market top playbook would have, uh, you know, negative uh, divergences with breadth, and this is one of the places where you'd expect to see it. You saw negative divergences here uh, in the breadth readings in uh, January, February of 2020. You also saw them here. You can see the uh, purple line that I drew here. This is as the market accelerated into its August peak. You saw lower peaks in the uh, advanced decline lines for the NYSE for mid caps and for small caps was not the case for the S&P. And that was just before the September, October, sort of the last corrective period that we had, the pause before uh, the November and, and December rally. So we have not really seen a divergence yet from some of those cumulative advanced decline lines. I'd be, I'd be looking to see if we get breakdowns, if these continue, uh, if these roll over, if you get a uh, break below the 50 day moving average here in blue on each of these, that would be an indication you break below the swing low uh, there from the end of January. That's what I'd be looking for on the S&P 500. And that's what I'd be looking for on these breadth readings. We're nowhere near that just yet. In terms of distribution, this fluctuated quite a bit and, and people measure this in different ways. This is the percent of uh, stocks on the NYSE uh, closing higher on the day in green, closing lower on the day in, uh, in red. This is sort of our daily advanced decline line. Uh, this is about an 86% down day, it looks like, uh, as, a, as of the time I was updating this uh, around the close. That's really, really close to a full distribution to a 90% down day. And depending on how you measure it, it might've actually been a 90% down day. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can measure this sort of, uh, this sort of thing. We are at a uh, you know, pretty extreme uh, down tape there. If almost nine out of 10 were, uh, were lower, this is looking a lot like days we had in October and September of last year, even back here to last June. These are days that are more part of corrective uh, patterns. These are not the types of days you see in healthy bull phases. These are more in the consolidation to down phases. So it'll be interesting to see, especially when you get a cluster of those 80 to 90% days, that tells you uh, a little more weakness than you may have expected up until now. Continuing on, you know, this is a chart we've talked about for, for a little while, and I think we're starting to see the, um, uh, the emergence of that playing out, which is a divergence between uh, the S&P itself and the uh, percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. That's here in, uh, in green at the bottom. Every time the S&P has gone higher uh, over the last two months since the end of last year, less and less S&P stocks have regained their 50-day moving average. While the S&P has remained above its 50-day, many S&P stocks are getting below their 50-day and are not getting back above them. That is not the sign of a, of a healthy market. What you know, a healthy market is the S&P going higher and this remaining elevated, suggesting that most stocks are above their 50-day moving average. We're seeing the opposite of that. Uh, which is more of a, uh, a toppy sort of pattern. This is what you see at the end of a bull market phase uh, when uh, stocks are not able to regain their 50-day, not able to push to new highs while the S&P uh, is doing so. This is the percent or, or the number of stocks in the S&P making a new 52-week high. This is not yet updated for today. We'll update this in a little while, uh, but this is an important chart to, uh, to look at. Yesterday, if you look at um, Wednesday's session, 98 out of the 500 stocks in the S&P, a full 20% made a new 52-week high yesterday. So while the S&P did not quite make a new high, a lot of stocks did. Today, I think you'll see uh, very few uh, that continued to make a new 52-week uh, high today. A healthy market is the market going higher and more and more stocks making 52-week highs as more and more of them are able to eclipse their previous peaks. Uh, the increasing number of new highs as the market appreciated was an encouraging sign. An evaporation in that number of new highs would be a, a key bearish tell. And again, it's not been the case up until uh, up until today. Where we have seen some confirmation is from the bullish percent index. This looks a lot like at, at the 
uh, looks like a, a, like the S and P uh, above their 50 day moving average. As the market's gone higher, you've seen less and less stocks uh, in a, a point and figure buy signal, which is what this measures. What percent of the S and P are in a buy signal according to the point and figure charts versus a sell signal? And you can see it's currently around 60, 62 percent. It's back below 70%, which is called a bear alert, which tells you it could be the conditions for a bearish phase. But you're also seeing this divergence of lower peaks in the bullish percent while you see higher peaks in the price. So as you can tell, it's sort of mixed, right? The cumulative advance decline lines have been uh, totally fine. Uh, if you look at the new highs list, it's actually been expanding. And, and this week, we've seen a healthy number of S&P stocks making new highs. But on the other hand, you've seen less and less stocks above their 50-day moving average, the bullish percent index sloping down as well. So I wouldn't describe that as bearish. I would certainly feel comfortable describing that as mixed, indicating uh, some internal weakness as you have higher highs in price, but lower peaks in some of those uh, momentum or some of those uh, breadth measures. Final, final one I'll leave you with, and then we need to wrap the show, is the McClellan Oscillator. Uh, I was talking with uh, Mark Chaikin earlier this morning, uh, and he, he created things like the chicken oscillator, the chicken money flow, some of the things that we, uh, many of us take for granted and incorporate as part of our normal toolkit. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about just, you know, overall market conditions and how to look at strength of the market. Tom McClellan created, or his, his parents created the McClellan oscillator. He's continued to promote it and use it in, uh, in his own work. And as you can see, in general, a McClellan oscillator below zero suggests negative breadth above zero uh, is positive breadth. And this is basically using moving averages of advanced decline line. So overall, it's been in a negative territory for the last uh, week or two. It'd be interesting to see if that remains low, especially given a, uh, a pullback in stocks that we're starting to see today. That is our banking on breadth segment. We need to wrap the show. Three charts in three minutes, the three and three. Here we go. Chart number one is the percent advancers decliners. We had 86% of stocks by my read on the NYSC uh, down today. That's pretty significant. Those sorts of distribution days you have in corrective patterns, not in bullish patterns. I, I would say it's fair to say we're in a in a choppy to down market at this point, even though it's worth also making uh, you know making clear that the trend remains positive. When I'm talking about negative breadth, when I'm talking about distribution patterns, talking about support levels, it's worth noting that the S and P still hasn't broken its 50-day moving average. It still ha has held its uh, its January low. Same with semiconductors, same with a lot of, uh, of high-flying groups that have started being under, been under pressure recently. So, you know, those things holding would certainly uh, suggest that we're in more of a viable pullback, a tactical pullback within a long-term uptrend. We start breaking down through some of those support levels. I think you have to question, um, you know, the, the longevity of the uptrend and, and think about the increased risk of further downside. I think days like this, where almost 90% of stocks are down on the day, tell me to expect more about the uh, increased risk of, risk of potential downside from here. Chart number two is NVIDIA. You know, we talked about uh, semiconductors a lot recently. I, I think it's one of the clearest examples of a bearish divergence uh, here on the SMH where you have higher highs in price, you have lower peaks in the RSI. I went on Bloomberg TV yesterday, and uh, this is one of the charts that we talked about, just this, this weakness in momentum. And this is either going to be the most perfect picture, uh, perfect textbook example of a bearish divergence or one of the most colossal, uh, ineffective examples ever. Either way, I think it's going to be worth paying attention to see if this plays out or not. But for this to be validated, you need to break uh, down and, and follow through. Uh, today, the SMH down 5%, which I think you know tells me that uh, that there's, there's certainly a very real risk of that happening from here. I think NVIDIA is an interesting chart, not just because of the fact that it's down 8% today, uh, not the fact that it's in a in a uh, high flying group semiconductors which overall have been you know very very uh, um, uh, you know strong over the long term but have shown some short term weakness it's the fact that it had a really good earnings report yesterday it was up in the after hour session yesterday down big today so stocks beating earnings and down is not a good sign for the overall market environment finally bitcoin you know I'm asked a lot about cryptocurrencies and what it means from a technical perspective. They are super volatile. They have huge price swings, but I would argue, and I'm certainly biased in this one in terms of the use of charts, I still think it's a very valid, I think charts are, are better than anything when you're trying to get your head around a, uh, a market that is driven by investor psychology. We pulled back 38.2% of the January to February run. That's around 47,000. We break that, I think you look down to 40,000, which is right around the 50 day moving average. That might be an interesting downside target uh, before a next leg higher in cryptocurrencies if we do not hold 47,000. Folks, that is our show for today. Special thanks to Cliff Droke 
from the Cabot Wealth Network for joining us. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.